Today is May 27th, 2018. The title of today's sermon is, You're So Lame. Just in case I didn't say you're so vain. You're so lame. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'll explain that later. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 4. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to stop and I'm going to interrupt my own service because I can. Hey, D'Angelia. <laughs> Amen. Hey, so for those of you who don't know, uh, D'Angelia is a walking miracle. Uh, we can share that testimony in more full detail at, at another time. I, I want her to share it with you at some point. But on Easter Sunday, on Passover Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday this year, April 1st, uh, D'Angelia right back uh, about where uh, Lena is sitting or so, somewhere back over there in that corner, uh, had uh, went into cardiac arrest and died right back there. The Lord has chosen to resuscitate her, to cause her to live, and she is here with us now walking on her own power in our midst today. Come on now, y'all can do better than that. We will definitely make time at some point in the future to hear the testimony, but uh, that, that's an encouragement. To, I didn't know you guys were going to be here today. Uh, it's so good to see you guys. We're so glad. They've been battling. We're going to continue to pray that there's 100% restoration there. And uh, we serve a God who brings back people from the dead. God. What's your problem today? <laughs> what's, what's bothering you today? Yeah, is it that? Yeah, I, I think you're going to be okay. We serve a God who can do amazing things. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, say there when you're there. there. The Word of God says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. Man, what an incredible, incredible passage. We are so familiar with this. We have those in our midst who could quote this in Hebrew. It's amazing. We love this passage of Scripture. It's hard not to see this as the imperative of what we are supposed to be doing. As a command from the Lord that says, You are supposed to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. This is what you are commanded to do. Uh, I'm going to throw a curveball at you already. So let's put this in the NASB. I want you to see what this says in the New American Standard Bible. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. You know, one of the things that I've been blessed with this week is this thought. Not only is this a command, not only is it an imperative, love the Lord. Come on, come on somebody look at your neighbor and say, love the Lord. Love the Lord. Come on, look at the other person you didn't want to talk to say, love him with all. Not only is it imperative of what we are supposed to do. Can you look at this verse for just a second? What if the Lord is not only giving us instruction? What if he's giving us a promise at the same time? What if it's not just you have to do this? Okay, I'm not sure that I can. I really want to try. I, I really want to love him with all. But loving with all is a difficult thing for us as human beings, isn't it? We can think that we love him with all, but we're holding things back. Yeah, I'm doing the best that I can, Lord. I really do want to love you with all. But what if he's saying this? You shall love the Lord. What if he's saying, with my strength, you will be able to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Can you really do this without him anyway? No. I, I, don't, I don't know where we are today. Um, that was lame. Your response was lame. So we're going to just try to, I'm going to pretend like we didn't do that. We'll edit it out of the video. No one will even know this part happened. Can you really love the Lord with all, without his help anyway? No. Okay, thank you. 
So what if this is a promise from the heavens that says, David, if you will serve me, I'm going to make sure that you will love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. I'm going to work on your behalf, Michael. I'm going to help you. I'm going to be there with you to strengthen you, to be able to love with all. We can't love with all because we are fractured, lame people. We can be broken and I'm going to give you the best that I have, but it's kind of like when a kid draws something for you. And you're going to put it on the refrigerator and you know you are. But we're not usually talking Michelangelo here. I was going to say Picasso and I was like, well, actually, it may be. <laughs> Sorry. Had to, had to filter through the right people there. It could be kind of Picasso-esque. What if the Lord is here to help us today? To say, I'm going to help you to love me with all. He always gives us commands that are just outside of our reach, aren't they? Hey, I want you to to replenish. I want you to fill the earth. I want you to rule over this thing. Okay, Adam, I want you to repopulate. I want you to fill the earth. Go, Adam, all by yourself. Do it. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Lord, I can't actually do that by myself. I need an easer. I, I have to have someone else to help me to do this. This is exactly what I believe the Lord is telling us today. I know, and for most of my life, I've looked at this as the imperative only. I've just been blessed this week thinking about it as being a promise to us. That he's going to help us to do it because it's got to be in his strength anyway. It's got to be something that is beautiful that he does on our behalf, that strength that we don't have, that he gives us. Let's turn with me. Turn to Zephaniah chapter 3. Man, the last few weeks we have had some, some... Beautiful sermons. On Mother's Day, we had generations that are stirred and not shaken. Golly, to move our hearts that we should stir something up on the inside of us, that we should stir, that it might reach the heavens, that each generation will be stronger and stronger, that the next generation is stronger than this one, that the generation after that is stronger than that one. We heard from one of our missionaries about agape from the heart of an evangelist. Then we heard about having our own personal theophany. Come on, somebody turn to your neighbor and say theophany. Where God comes down and meets with you. On Wednesday night. Harder, better, faster, stronger. Come on now. The Lord is helping us here. Let's look in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9. Are you there? It says this. Then I will purify the lips of the peoples that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve Him shoulder to shoulder. Man, what a beautiful thought. You get to serve alongside of people. The idea that you're going to be in ranks. Whether you're thinking military, my nerd boy background and being in marching band, I think of having to line up on a sideline, getting ready to enter a football field. Shoulder to shoulder with people, you have a common purpose, you have common direction. Man, this is an exciting thing that we get to do this together. What a beautiful thought for us today. But I want you to see something here in the idea of serving shoulder to shoulder. If you could put up the Hebrew. I want you to see this in an in interlinear translation, and that's not exactly what this says. Here, the NIV translated that we will serve him shoulder to shoulder. But what it really is saying It's something more along the lines of you're going to serve the Lord with one consent. With an ihad of consent. I was like, well, that's an interesting look. That's an interesting piece there that we have ihad. Everybody say ihad. Ihad Ihad is a plural unity. The Lord our God, the Lord is ihad. That's what it means. There's there's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit, but they are always working as one. Never one bit of difference between any thought, between any heart's desire. And in this case, we see here in Zephaniah that it says that we're going to serve the Lord right down at the bottom with one consent. With one consent. With ihad consent. And I thought, with one consent, well, I I guess we all agree together. We're all going to be in one, we're going to shoulder to shoulder. I see why they would translate it as an expression that says shoulder to shoulder. But let's look at the next slide that we have. And I want you to see that word for consent. It's not just that it's a consent, a masculine noun referring to a shoulder. 
Yeah, well, pastor, I mean, it says shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, do you understand what it's saying? It's saying not with shoulder to shoulder, but with one shoulder, we stand together. With, with one shoulder, we're going to stand together. Now, wait a minute. I thought there was a bunch of them. So we're trying to express the idea that there are people who are standing side by side. But what happens? You're all going to get with one shoulder and get up under the load. You're going to be together in such a way. Can you look down at the bottom, the other part that's highlighted there? It says a yoke is worn on the shoulders. The idea that you are under one singular burden. Everybody say singular burden. There's one purpose that we have as a church. We have many parts. We have many members. But we are all members of what? We are all members of what? We're all part of one body. We have different functions. But there's one yoke. There's one leading that the Lord has. There's one purpose for His body of Christ. And we all have little parts of that one part. Does that make sense to you today? This look uh, at, at while we're talking about here, we've looked at the Hebrew. We've looked at a definition. Let's look what it says in the Septuagint. We're going English. We're going different translations. We're going Hebrew. Now we're going to go Greek. That was written by the Hebrew people. For then I will transfer upon the peoples one tongue for their generation. For all to call upon the name of the Lord. To serve Him under one yoke. Come on, are you ready to serve the Lord today under one yoke? Shoulder to shoulder, yes, but we're going to get up with one shoulder. We want to operate today as one man, with one voice, with one heart, in one spirit, for one Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. This is what we're called to in this place today. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 5. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 13 and 14. Now, I want you guys to stay with me here because the idea of one shoulder is a pretty important piece today. It's an important understanding. And yet, this is not a new teaching for us. Ehad, yes, pastor, we know we're supposed to be operating in one. Uh, this is a difficult task to do, my friends. Ever had a time when your household was not in Ehad? Anybody experienced that this morning trying to get to church? <laughs> <laughs> Rob, Rob said it and he just came by himself that was incredible <laughs> yes pastor I was not in Ehad with myself today oh okay amen I've had those days too actually now that I think about it that was that's true how many things do we know in the word but have yet to implement rightly in the word because you know what I know as your pastor as one of your pastors here in this place I know that some of us are struggling to understand where we fit in in the body here. I know that some of us are crying out like, yeah, I know, man, this church is doing some stuff. This, this church, we've been on four continents, five countries simultaneously within the last few months. And that's not all. We're going to keep getting after it. We're going to reach the world. We don't want one corner, not one unreached people group. Lord, if you'll give it to us, we'll t we want them all. For surely the Aswan region, that's, we know that we're heading there and we're not going to neglect what else the Lord puts in our, in our, in our path. Amen. Lord, give us the nations as our inheritance. Come on, we want... Lord, help us to reach them. The them that are in our own neighborhoods. The them that are in our own communities. The them that are across the world. Lord, we want to reach them all. Lord, we don't care what language. We don't care what tribe. We don't care what ethnicity they are. Just give us... Let us go. Boy, it's one thing to do that, and then what do we do? We come back here, and we're not quite sure if we're supposed to open up our home or have people over. We're uncertain about what we're supposed to do today. Sometimes it's easy to see the big vision. Sometimes it's easy when we're in the midst of a battle. What, what happens when we are really, really battling as a church? We all have a singular focus, don't we? We're trying to stay alive. <laughs> We're trying to do what God, it doesn't matter the opposition. We're going to keep pressing forward. Sometimes it's easy during wartime because it helps you to understand the necessity of Ichad. What happens when you're not directly in big time warfare today? Oh, we know globally that we are, but what about today? 
Anybody ever had just a normal day? Anybody had more normal days than you had supernatural days? Me? Anybody look at the Bible and depressed sometimes that your, your life doesn't look exactly like that, forgetting that there might be 10 years from this chapter to this chapter? Me? Man, I want to be that. I read Hebrews 11 and cry all the time. Y'all know me. I, I, I cry easy, right? I'm like, I want to do that for you, Lord. I want to do it. Yeah, just keep walking in your heart, son. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. I'm going to help you to do it. I know that that's your desire. I know what your desires are better than you do, son. Yeah, I know. I forget. I re- Lord, I really want to do this. I really want to fulfill my purpose. Yes, then you must be in Ehad. You must have a oneness, not only within you, which is hard enough, not only to get your family in Ehad and moving in the same direction. I used to say that sometimes with the little kids in the house, it feels like you're trying to herd cats. You don't herd cats. You're trying to get one and one will squirt off the wrong direction. You go get that one and then somebody goes over here. In my family, we have this incredible thing. And I won't throw any of my oldest daughters under the bus by telling you who this would be. (laughs) Are you ready? Yes, Daddy, I am ready. Are you sure that you're ready? Because when I'm ready to go, I want to go. Yes, Daddy, I'm ready. Okay, it's time to go. I'm ready, Dad. I just now need to put on my shoes, brush my teeth, and fix my hair. I don't think you know what ready means. Because if you still have other stuff to do, then you're not yet ready. Man, don't we do that to the Lord? I am ready for everything that you have, Lord. All I need to do is take care of where I'm going to go and take care of my covering and then do this. Yeah, so I'm really not ready yet. Come on now. I know it's simple, right? Just, Just real talk to you guys today. As we're doing this, Our heart is to get this church under the ichad of Christ. For us to move together. You know what that does for you? That rejuvenates your very spirit. That reminds you that in fact you shall love the Lord. It's going to help us to do this. Because what happens is, what is the enemy always trying to do? He's always trying to separate you from the body. He's always trying to say, yeah, you don't belong here. As a matter of fact, you don't belong anywhere. As a matter of fact, maybe you ought to just go home, sit at your house, because we can all get with the Lord, can't we? We can all hear from the Lord on our own. So I'm going to go home, and I'm going to read my Bible, Chris. Of course you can, but you know what you can't do by yourself? Have you had? <laughs> of course you can hear from the Lord. We want you to do that daily, and then you know what you do? You come together so that with one shoulder, you're able to carry the load. You're able to be under the yoke of Christ and do what He's telling us to do. We cannot be so American in our thoughts of this. And I know that we have people in our little body of Christ that have, I think we have 15 different passports, 15 different nationalities here in our midst. I love that, by the way. If we can get to more, I'm, I'd, be, I'd be glad to have more. People who were born outside the United States in this congregation, that's beautiful because it means that we're setting aside any of our natural Cultures. We're saying that the culture of the kingdom is much more important than the, col- the color of our skin yeah. or the complexion that we have or where we were born or what language we speak. Yeah. And my goodness, we speak so many languages in this place. Yeah. I love it. It's like heaven, man. Yeah. This is just a little small part. I love my church. Yeah. But what you can't do is become overly American and decide that you need to have this tailored your way. How many people are trying to do that? Why, why do your friends pick the church that they do? Because it's close to their house. Because they have a really good kids ministry. Because they have something for the single moms. Because they have some cool stuff for the youth on such and such night. It's like we're ordering from a menu. I like this. Ooh. Ooh, I like the extra features. Can I get the upsize on that church? That'd be fantastic. I'd like the extra bonus package for that, please. You know what 
we're trying to pick our church from and be a part of is that it's got to have the right spirit. There's a single ihad. You can't just decide where you go. I feel like the Lord assigns you a place to go. You're either going to decide you're going to go or not. I know when the Lord assigned Ben to this church. I remember a time when he was not completely fully here. He was kind of here and kind of not. And you know what we did? We loved him enough to go, say, man, what are you doing? What the heck? Quit dating us. Put a ring on it. (laughs) Put a ring on it. You can't date the church of Christ. You can't date a relationship with God. Why? Because that means you'll never be any hot. You'll never have the unity. You'll never actually put your shoulder up under the yoke that he's got for you. God, there's something so powerful about us all going, yeah, I don't know. If you're standing back, you're like, that looks really, really heavy. I don't know if I could do that. Put your shoulder up under that. Get in one shoulder with everybody else and let the Lord promise you that you can accomplish it. Let the Lord start doing something supernatural in you. Quit evaluating it based on what you can do in the natural. The whole point is, he's asking us to do supernatural things. It's ridiculous what, what, what we do as a church. It's ridiculous. Nobody this size should be in as many countries doing as many things as we are. Just ask Alex Adarme, what we, Adarmas what we shouldn't be doing financially. <laughs> what a godly man. I'm like, Alex... Can you fix this? <laughs> Man, what a, what a, come on now. God has some things for us. We're in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Verse 13. I'll get back to it. Yes, amen. The trumpeters and singers joined in unison. You know what that word there is? Ichad. They were as one. That's what the original language, that would be a closer translation. The trumpeters and musicians were any hod to give praise and thanks to, to the Lord, accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments. They raised their voice in praise to the Lord and sang. They raised their voice and sang a singular item. He is good. His love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud. Come on now. You know why it's so powerful when we get together and worship? Because we raise our voices any hot. Can you tell when we don't, honestly? When we're all distracted, we're all thinking about our day, we're all thinking about how tough it's been or our struggles. When you're thinking about yourself, when you come into this place, can you feel sometimes? Anybody ever take a little while to get into worship? What is taking a while to get into worship means? It means that you were focused on yourself and you come into other people And at some point, we all start just looking at Christ. We all put one shoulder up under the yoke together, and then he just falls on us. We feel his presence. It starts changing us. We start going, golly, I need to repent for that. Man, I need to get better at that. Oh my gosh, look at you. May you receive the just reward of your suffering. And not only that, but may you receive it in me. God, does that just wreck your soul when you hear that line? God, it does when I'm in the right ihad, I can sing it all day long and it not mean much until I'm actually in the right spirit about it. Until I'm actually singing in unison with you. In ihad. What an incredible thing. Let's be in unison. Let's be in ihad. Let's turn to Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter 3. And let's look at verse 8. It says this. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the prophets. Everybody see that there? There is a certain people. You know what the word there for certain people is? There is an Ehad people. There's a people who are so connected, who are so joined, it's like they're one people group. Yeah, I know they're ethnically one people group, right? But what if it's that they're so connected, they're so together, that they're identified by their togetherness? 
They're identified by having one shoulder up under the load. They're identified by one thing, and that's Ehad. Wow. And then you know what it says? Look at that. There's a certain people dispersed among the peoples. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> There's one people that are everywhere. The altogether people that are every, scattered out everywhere. They're dispersed and scattered. You know what that feels like to me? Feels like the one association to me. Amen. There's one people. They have one heart. They have one mind. They're in one spirit. They are one Lord. And you know what they do? They're everywhere. Amen. For LCM, we've said that there's one life, one family, and one nation. We see that as the progression of what took place in this church. Lord told Pastor Eric and Pastor Matt as they were building this church, just focus on the one life in front of you. And then you do that long enough and you realize that you better deal with the families that are there. And the reason that you're building strong families is to send people to the nations. You know what happens when, when you get to the nations? You're focusing on the one life that's right in front of you. This is supposed to be a perpetual thing. Do you know what it is for the one association? It's one spirit. We are an unashamedly spirit-filled group. We always are going to be an unashamedly spirit-filled group. We want you to speak in tongues. We want you to prophesy. If there are gifts, if there are fruit, if there's anything of the spirit, we want, you to be, we want you to have it and be operating in it. Desire earnestly the spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14. Man, we want you to be operating in it. We want to be operating in these things. It's one spirit, one body, one kingdom is what the one association is. One spirit, one body, one kingdom. You know where Pastor Eric is today? He's at King's Harvest Church in Denham Springs, Louisiana. You know what we have with Pastor Eric today? Ichad. We have some of our other members that are there in Denham Springs with him. You know what we have with them? Ihad. We have one shoulder. Because this is what the Lord is doing in our midst. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to start in verse 28. A very familiar passage to us. <clears throat> Look at verse 28. It says this, come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened. Anybody ever felt weary or burdened? Yes. Yes. Anybody felt weary or burdened this week? Yes. Today? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're not supposed to say that, but yes, it's true. We get to come to Christ and he will give you rest. Wow. What happens when he gives you rest? It changes everything about your outlook. Changes everything about how you perceive what's going on. Last couple of days, I've been grumpy. I know none of you get grumpy. Ever. Me, I get grumpy. I've been fussing. <clears throat> what's going on? <clears throat> I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> That's all. That's all you got. I don't even want to put it in words. I'm frustrated now that I have to explain myself. Just trying to be real. Things change when you get a little bit of rest in you. Those things that bothered you yesterday don't seem to bother you today because you got rest. The things that seemed insurmountable last night right before you went to bed, that when you get up in the morning, you're like, yeah, it's not as bad as I was thinking. Huh. How much more? That's just a physical rest. How much more when you get any hod with your brothers and your sisters and you've got one burden that you're carrying and you're like, oh, I'm feeling a little weak today, but since we're together, I know that he's promised that I can love him with all. I know that we can accomplish this together. The last thing that you, have, that you are able to do is pull away from this. Don't you dare pull away. I feel like we're in a cycle and I feel like the enemy is trying to plant seeds right now to to, I'm not saying he wants to pluck you off completely. I just think he wants to kind of scoot you over on a different side of the table. We, I just want you to be a little bit separate. I still want you to be kind of connected. But let's, you need a little space. 
You need a little space. No, you don't need a little space. Why? Because there's one shoulder. You don't, you don't have any room. Pastor, but I'm already not feeling good about it. Yeah, I know, and I'm giving you the answer. Amen. I, I'm actually giving you the answer. You think I'm just, I'm just saying something again because I want to say it. I'm saying it because it's the right answer for you. When you're feeling weak, don't pull away. Press in. Put your shoulder up under that thing. If, if we could teach you anything as your pastors, if we could teach you and show you anything from the people who love you like we do, is to say, don't pull away, because you know why? Sometimes people don't come back and get connected. Because a little bit away produces a little bit more away. Because then the further you get, you're not at the center of this thing, so when you do make a mistake, now it's harder for you to feel like you can step back in. Yeah, but, you don't, but I've been gone too long now. Now they're all going to look at me. Yeah, we're all too busy. We've got our shoulder up under this thing. We're like, you want to come help? Yes. Please, come help. Join us. But the truth is, is I don't need you to come and get under one shoulder because I need a lighter load. I'm not asking for that. I, the truth is, is I've been given my assignment in life and I don't want one less, I don't want one ounce less what the Lord, the weight that He has put on me. I want it on my shoulder. I want it on me. I don't want it. I want to fulfill His purpose in me. I want it there. What I'm not saying is for me. I'm not saying please come help because it will help me. I'm saying please come put your shoulder on this because it will help you. It is a righteous standard. If I hear one more thing about a standard, I am so tired of your church preaching about the standard. Come up to the standard. All I want to do is take a break. I just want a break. No. We love you. We love you. That's stupid. Don't be stupid. Don't be lame. Be normal. <laughs> Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. What? Whose yoke is this? His yoke. Yeah, his yoke. Take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. When you get under this right yoke, you realize how, what a gentle and beautiful thing it is. Yes, there's the warlike aspect. Of course there is. The truth is, is many of us in this room like the warlike aspect of it. It's kind of fun when you're in a battle and you've got your brothers beside you. It's, it really is. Actually, the truth is, we really want that part here. We don't want to be like the Mamby Pamby Christians. The little confectionaries that melt at the least bit of heat. You go ahead and turn up the heat because we can handle it. You know why? Because he promised us that we shall be able to overcome this. That we are, in fact, more than conquerors. I love that verse. You're not just a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. What's more than a conqueror? Us. <laughs> yes! And. Everybody say and. and. When we get up under this yoke, we find out that He is gentle and humble in heart, that He wants to help us. Anybody ever know... There are people that I know that are gruff on the outside, but you get to know them. God, they're so tender. You're like, you're a big teddy bear. Okay, you're a teddy bear that roars like a lion. That's, that's an interesting mix. That's exactly what we have. Not a teddy bear, but someone who is gentle and humble in heart in Christ. And you will find rest for your souls. Come on, anybody need some rest for your soul? For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. You know what it means from the easy there? It means that it functions however it's supposed to function. It's always right. It's well fit. It's easy. It helps you. What an incredible thought for us. We're one people because we're under one yoke. We can be an ihad because there just is a single yoke that we come put a single shoulder underneath. Turn to Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. It says this, when the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice coming from the four living creatures. You know what the word for scales is here? 
It's actually the same word as, that's used for yoke in Matthew. It is rightly translated as scales. Of course it is. But it's more of the idea that you have this beam that's across two. It's the yoke that's across two measurements of weight. It's this beam that's across that. What kind, of, what kind of measurement, what kind of balance does Jesus give us? What is his yoke? It's easy. His burden is light. What happens when you're under the yoke of sin? What happens when you're under the yoke of difficulty? Can there be anything that's more crushing than that? Turn to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. (laughs) I am always amazed at the straightforwardness and sometimes redundancy that the Bible seems to give us. Why did Jesus set you free? For freedom's sake. Thank you. Do you know why the Bible has to speak to us this way? Because we don't actually know this. The reason he tells us that we're like sheep is because we are in fact like sheep. We get confused. We get overwhelmed. We just gnaw on our little grass till we wander off. You know why he set you free? For freedom's sake. He set you free not to just break the chains. You can be like, yep, well, I'm free. Praise God, I'm free. No. He set you free for freedom's sake so you can go and do something. It is for freedom that Christ sets you free. Stand firm then. Stand. Now you can stand firm. Why? Because I'm a free man. He has set me free in Christ. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What yoke do you want to keep putting back on yourself? Do you want to keep putting back, uh, shoulder up under the, the yoke of Christ? Or do you want to keep letting yourself be yoked with other things? Yoke of slavery. Yoke of depression. Yoke of anxiety. A yoke of... Anybody ever felt like you just keep going around in the same circle? And you want, you, want to, you want to get me going crazy? It's just put me on a, some type of thing where I'm just doing the same thing over and over again. If he has set us free today, no longer put the yoke of slavery upon yourself. Be free from the sin life that you once had. Be free from the regret that comes. When you have a godly sorrow, it produces repentance. That leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Come on, do you have regret today? Perhaps you need to get some godly sorrow. Perhaps you need to feel the the, the freedom that He can liberate you with. Come on, this is a church that we are growing. We are going somewhere. But it's the, the way that we get there. The words of the last few weeks has been encouraging us not only for ourselves, but for them. That it's time. It's time to start. The Lord has said He's going to start to bring us a harvest. You know what a harvest means? I don't think we're going to double in size as a church because if we doubled in size, we'd send half of y'all away to start another church. We're not trying to see how many people we can get in here. We're trying to see how many people we can send from here. When he says that there's going to be a harvest, it means that there are others who need to be developed. It means that there are others that need to come in and help and put their shoulder under this load and find the freedom that is in Christ. Come on now. This is, this is a word for us today. Turn to Acts chapter 4. Let's look at verse 32. Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. It says this, all of the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions were his own, but they shared everything they had. Well, that's much easier said than done, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, we're going to share everything we have. Yeah, but not that. We're going to share everything that we have. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and much grace was upon them all. Why? Because they were in one heart and they were in one, one mind. The Hebrew word is ichad. The Greek word in the Newer Testament is homothumaden. 
Homo thumadon. <laughs> Homo thumadon. It's the same idea of having a unanimous, one heart, one mind, with one shoulder we get up under this load and we do exactly what Christ has told us to do. In Acts 2, we know that it said that every day they continued to meet together. Acts 2.42 says they continue to meet together every day. You know what the together is there? It's in perfect ihad or homo thumadon. It's in perfect unity. It's not just that they were in one location. Because guys, you and I both know you can be in one location and not be in unity with the people around you. You could be here today and not at all be in unity with what the Spirit's trying to tell you. You can be here physically present, but as far from someone as possible. Man, we need to have our hearts bound together today. In Acts 4, 24, it says this, When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said. Here it is again. You ever thought about this? You got a group of people. They raised their voice and said, It was a singular thing that came out of what they said. If I asked us all, come on, let's start talking right now. We're not going to all come up with the same stuff. But apparently, you can. (laughs) Sovereign Lord, they said. You made the heavens and the earth. They began to cry out to God with a singular response from multiple people. Let's Let's look at a few other passages here. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. And verse 12. We'll just quickly go through these as, as quickly as we can get there. Second Chronicles 30, 12, it says this. Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind. To carry out what the king and his officials had ordered following the word of the Lord. The unity of mind. They had a ichad in their heart. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 38. Let me read it to you. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and of action so that they will always fear me for their own good and for the good of their children after them. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Come on, you can't have an ichad heart when you have a stony heart. You can't have unity when there are parts of your heart that are still stony. God has to remove them. He will. You shall love the Lord your God. 1 Chronicles 12, 38 is when they came and with one mind made David king. Justin Triester read earlier at a Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It's like oil flowing down. It's a beautiful thing that happens. John chapter 17. Listen to what Jesus prays starting in verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Why are we supposed to have a unity of heart, a unity of mind, a unity of voice with one shoulder under the yoke of Christ? It's so that the world will know that we're actually been sent by him. Verse 23, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me. And have loved them even as you have loved me. Everyone turn with me to Romans 15 and verse 5. Romans 15 and verse 5. It says this. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, he gives us endurance. Come on, look at your other neighbor and say, He also gives us encouragement. May the God who gives, He gives it to you. Because I need it. We need it. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement, encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves. How? 
as you follow Christ Jesus, as you are under the yoke of Christ and not any other yoke, so that with one heart and with one mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, what a beautiful thought here today. Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. I want to I begin to wrap it up here in 2 Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 9. This is the story of David and Mephibosheth. This is one of my, this, this story holds special meaning for me in the Bible. I don't know what it is about it, but it, it, it grabs my, my soul every time that I read through it. David is there after he's, he's conquered the kingdoms. He is leading as king. And he's trying to see, hey, is there anyone still left that I can show kindness to? Look at verse 3. 2 Samuel 9, 3, it says this. The king asks, is there, any, is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. He had lost his father and his grandfather. As they were leaving, as a five-year-old boy, a nurse that was taking him away dropped him. There was an accident and he became lame in both feet. He became crippled in both feet. Verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 4. Where is he, the king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Maker, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. He was in a place that had no word. He was in a place that had no pastor. That's what Lodabar means. So King David had him brought From that place, Lodabar, from the house of Maker, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth! It's amazing. Anybody uh, anybody ever you're meeting and they just put joy on your face every time you see them? There's a lot of you guys in here that do that for me. Pastor Wade! Rick and Susan's son, Levi, usually, how, how old is Levi? Is he three? Yeah. So Levi will come and wherever he sees me, usually, now he won't do that today because I'm saying it, so it'll, it'll look like I'm not telling the truth. He will run, Pastor Way, and just jump. Can I tell you how much I love seeing Levi? I'm like, yes, come here. Man, I love you. You know what I hear when I hear David say Mephibosheth? I hear the same kind of excitement when Levi calls out my name and you just know it's just pure hearted and it's genuine. I hear David kind of doing the same thing. Mephibosheth! Man, it's so good to see you! Uh, <laughs> what was his reply? Your, your, your servant. Yeah, that was a little overwhelming to me. Verse 7, don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your, God, your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. I, you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, man, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? When you are understanding the overwhelming kindness of a king who wants to call out your name and say, Man, I want to move you towards me. I want to restore everything that should have been yours that was taken from you. I want to give you a place at my table. Come on, that should start stirring your soul today. Do you know what Mephibosheth, the name Mephibosheth means? It's an exterminator of shame. It's a shame destroyer. Now get this with me. Come on, think with me here. Mephibosheth is a shame destroyer. What position is Mephibosheth in when David says, Man, it's good to see you. He's ashamed. 
He has nothing. He's broken and lame. (laughs) Maybe I love this story so much because I can relate to it. Not many of you are wise or noble. Not many of you of royal birth. But the Lord chose the weak, the broken, the non-noble. He chose the lame things of this world so that when His power is seen in you, Come on, be with me here for a second. He chose the lame things so that when He pulls you up to the table, you know what nobody sees anymore? They don't see your lameness anymore. They don't see what you can't do anymore. All they see is you as one sitting at the King's table who has been given honor that your shame has been destroyed. Come on, are you guys with me or not today? What in your life, Ray, do we need to have that shame destroyed? Come on, Chris. What about Carlos? What in your life, those shames that God just wants you to pull in and say, there is one yoke. You come and be part of what I'm doing, and I will cover every part of your shame. And you'll sit and you'll eat as one of my sons. From that day forward, Mephibosheth was able to live. In Jerusalem, he was able to sit at the king's table and be restored in every way. What needs to be restored in your life? Maybe it's just the joy. Maybe it's just the understanding that if you just stay with him, he covers your shame. It's what happens in worship when you're focused on yourself versus focusing on him. Now, I can't imagine what it felt like for the first time that Mephibosheth pulled up to the table. By this point, he's a grown man. He's not a child anymore. He's a grown man. And he pulls up to the table and says, the thing that I've always focused on was men my lack. The thing that I've always focused on is what I can't do and the sad tragedies that happened to me in the past. But now I am considered as one of the king's sons. And if I will come up under this with one shoulder, if I will just pull myself up under His yoke, if I will just pull myself right by His table, then it may cover me in His presence. I have equal footing with every one of His sons. The future kings, I am sitting with them. Let me encourage you, church, if you're here today, like Mephibosheth, The Lord wants to bring you closer to His table. Do you see why we preach to you, don't pull away? What happens when you pull away? You're reminded that you're lame. What happens if you'll just keep pressing in to His presence? Your shame is destroyed. Your shame can be destroyed today. Let's finish out Mephibosheth's story. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to read two more passages and then we're going to close. 2 Samuel chapter 16. As you're turning there, I have a quote from from Charles Spurgeon that I wanted to read to you today. Um, This is actually in our Bible, the Bible program that I use. There's actually a morning Spurgeon devotional that just pops up when you turn it on. Halfway through our study time this morning, Pastor Matt said, hey, take a look at the Spurgeon quote from today. The Spurgeon devotional. It's talking about Mephibosheth. Such is the love which the Father bears to His only begotten, that for His sake He raises His lowly brethren from poverty and banishment to courtly companionship, noble rank, and royal provision. Their deformity shall not rob them of their privileges. Lameness is no bar to sonship. (laughs) Come on, Cody. Lameness is no bar to sonship. A king's table is a noble hiding place for lame legs. And at the gospel feast, we learn to glory in infirmities because the power of Christ rests on us. You know what I feel like the enemy's trying to do to our church right now in this season? He's trying to glorify your lameness. He's trying to let that to be the only thing that you can see. Your weakness, how frail you are, what you can't do. 
And then what he takes from that is to say, see, you don't deserve to be around the table with them. You don't deserve to shoulder underneath that yoke of Christ because you're lame. Lame though I may be, the king has called me. You're right, I may be lame in so many ways, but my king has called me and I will respond to his call. I'm called to be holy. We are called to be holy. We're called to suffer. We're called to be like him. We're called to be in fellowship. We're called to have hope. We're called to have peace. We're called to be a kingdom of priests. We're called with his very power and his wisdom. You're called today. The king has called you by name and it's a joyful calling. Boy, this sounds like it could be a salvation message, doesn't it? And yet I'm talking to those who are in the kingdom and need to come to the table. Need to come to the table and feast on the very word of God. Need to come to the table and be feasting on his encouragement and on his provision today. 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 3 and 4. It says this. The king then asked, where is your master's grandson? Talking about Mephibosheth. Ziba said to him, he is staying in Jerusalem because he thinks today the house of Israel will give me back my grandfather's kingdom. So uh, Ziba is actually throwing Mephibosheth under the bus. He is cre creating dissension between King David and Mephibosheth. Verse 4, then the king said to Ziba, fine, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. There's difficulty even after this. It appears that this is not going to work out the correct way. But let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 19. And let's look at verse 24. Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, also went down to meet the king. He had not taken care of his feet or trimmed his mustache or washed his clothes from the day the king left until the day he returned safety, safely. Wow. It's amazing what the presence of a king will do in your life. Without close proximity to the king, you know what happens? We all fall into disarray so very quickly. The things that had been hidden are now brought back to the surface and we haven't been taking care of them very well. Verse 25, when he came from Jerusalem to meet the king, the king asked him, why didn't you go with me, Mephibosheth? He said, my lord, the king, since I, your servant, am lame. <laughs> he was reminded of his lameness because he wasn't there at the king's table. I said, I will have my donkey saddled and will ride on it so I can go with the king. But Ziba, my servant, betrayed me. Our fleshly nature will always betray us. And he has slandered your servant to my Lord the King. My Lord the King is like an angel of God, so do whatever pleases you. All my grandfather's descendants deserve nothing but death from the Lord, the, my Lord the King. But you gave your servant a place among those who eat at your table. You know what he's doing here? He's being reminded of that sweet, sweet fellowship with the Lord. That sweet unity, that sweet oneness that he had. So what right do I have to make any more appeals to the king. Can't we all say that? Lord, you've done so many good things. I'm not sure that I, I should even have the right to ask you for anything else. If the Lord never does anything else gracious to you, do you know what? <laughs> He's already done so much for us. He's already done so much in our midst. The king said to him in verse 29, why say more? <laughs> I order you and Ziba to divide the fields. Yeah, I'm going to give you back. I can restore to you in a moment. At a word, I can give you back anything that you need. Look at verse 30. Mephibosheth said to the king, Yeah, let him take everything. Now that my lord the king has arrived home safely. What is the conclusion of this matter? Yeah, you know what? I want to give you back everything that you need. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to restore to you. He's like, yeah, I don't need any of that as long as I have you. <laughs> I don't need anything else, Lord. I just need unity with you. As long as you and I are together, then you will make me love you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my strength. As long as I can get under the yoke that you have set before me, my life is right. 
I don't need anything else. In Christ alone, this is all that I need is for you to be with me. Help me to be one with you, Lord. Come on, what lameness do we need to get over here in this place today? What areas have we decided that it was better for us to pull away instead of with one shoulder get under the load that the Lord has for us? Have you had thoughts that you've been dealing with lately about you not knowing how to fit in in this place? Have you had thoughts questioning your own place in the kingdom and what you should be doing? Those are demonic attacks against this body. Because the Lord is saying, yeah, I'm with you. I will help you to do this. Would you stand to your feet today?